Okay. Welcome to Personalize Your Plate. What can an RD do for me? Welcome and thank you for joining us this evening. This program is brought to you by Northwell Health. Northern Westchester Hospital, Center for Healthy Living, the Katz Institute for Women's Health, Cohen Children's Medical Center, South Shore University Hospital, and Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. My name is Amy Rosenfeld and I am the moderator for this panel this evening. I'm a registered dietitian for Northern Westchester Hospital's Community Health Education and Outreach Department and for our Center for Healthy Living program. March is National Nutrition Month, so there's no better month to learn about nutrition and health. And with so many mixed messages out there about nutrition, it's really hard to know what's healthy. So tonight we'll be discussing some tips and tricks to a healthy eating lifestyle and debunking some popular nutrition myths. Today is actually National uh, Registered Dietitian Day, March 10th. Uh, so it's a day to celebrate the food and nutrition experts. And tonight we'll discuss what the benefits are to working with a registered dietitian and how exactly the process works. With me this evening, I have three fellow panelists from Northwell, Sharon Zarabi, registered dietitian and certified personal trainer and program director at Katz Institute of Women's Health at Northwell. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you. I have Stephanie Defiglia peck registered dietitian, certified diabetes educator, a nutrition coordinator for the Pediatric Service Line Program Nutritionist Power Kids Weight Management Program for Cohen Children's Medical Center. Welcome, Stephanie. Hi. And I have Dr. Razia Jamin, Health Co-Director and Ambulatory Clerkships and Hospitalist at Department of Medicine at South Shore University Hospital, an Assistant Professor of Medicine and Science Education at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra. Welcome, Dr. Jamin. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> so just a couple of things, logistics for the program. Um, many of you submitted questions uh, when you registered and uh, we'll, we'll take question and answers from your pre-submitted questions as time permits at the end. If you have any questions about anything that you hear it comes up during the presentation, please feel free to put it in the chat function. And as time permits, we will get to that. At the end of the presentation, if you're interested in booking an appointment with a registered dietitian from Northwell Health, please fill out the brief survey that will appear automatically on your screen after this webinar ends, and you can put your name and contact information in that survey. Your contact information will be kept confidential, and someone will get back to you about scheduling your appointments. Also, please know that this program is intended to not intended to provide personal medical advice and is intended for educational purposes only. Nutritional needs are personal and are best met through medical nutrition therapy provided by a certified registered dietitian. If you have any concerns about individual medical needs or nutrition concerns, please seek an appointment with a registered dietitian. So let's get started. Our first question will uh, be addressed to two of our panelists. With so much information about nutrition, it's really, really hard to know what's viable and credible information. Stephanie, what is the healthiest way of eating? Okay, so the healthiest way of eating really involves having a good dietary pattern that considers many different factors, um, your unique needs, where you are in your stage of life, um, and what you basically prefer to have and following healthy guidelines, excuse me, that include all the food groups. So not restricting, including all the food groups um, and allowing for enough variety, as well as having enough hydration, making sure that you are well hydrated um, and that you're following whatever unique needs that you have. Great. Sharon, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, yeah, so thank you, Stephanie, for that. I think it's, it's a difficult question to answer because I always get the question, I'm sure most of you do too, is, is what is the healthiest diet? And a lot of how I counsel is really gauged to the goals of a specific you know, patient or client that I'm, I'm speaking to. It's, well, what is your personal goal? So my specialty um, has been in the weight loss surgery department for you know, 15 years and I had patients who were suffering with, you know, insulin resistance and for them, we might need to, you know, cut back on some of the carbohydrates that they're eating. And I know we're going to get into a talk of speaking about different types of carbs, but um, I think it's really important to identify what is your health goal. And then from there, including whole foods, 
So anything that comes up from a tree, anything that comes through nature, hydration, as Stephanie mentioned, and being consistent with it. So something that will be for the long term. Excellent. Thank you. For our next question, I will pull up a, a graphic image for our, our viewers to kind of have more of a understanding of the visual of what you're talking about. We'll start with Sharon. Can you answer, how can we personalize our plate to our specific tastes, cultural preferences, while still maintaining the healthy plate method? And I'll share what exactly the healthy plate method is that I'm referring to. So yeah, I um, <laughs> just to divulge a little private information about myself, but I, I'm of Persian descent. And if anyone ever told me that we have to take out rice from our diet, I think it would break my mother's heart. So it's, it's, it's important to be culturally sensitive. Um, it, according to the Harvard um, plate, we have a proportion of our plate that needs to be vegetable focused, whole grains, healthy proteins and fruits. And I think if we look into any type of traditional cuisine, whether it's um, Asian, you know, Indian, um, Hispanic, you're going to see some sort of pattern with a whole grain, a vegetable, a protein, you know, and some sort of fruit that comes from, you know, the, the motherland. And I think we need to really identify the portions that we're using. I think um, seasonings give our, our food so much flavor. So one of my little tricks when I'm trying to get people to, you know, maybe reduce their calories for weight loss goals is uh, to replace rice with riced cauliflower and whatever traditional seasoning that you'd put on, whether it's, um, you know, a curcumin, um, whether it's like a za'atar with oregano for an Italian or, or a Middle Eastern spice, it's, it's jazzing up, you know, the vegetables, the low calorie foods with whatever seasonings, spices, sauces you'd normally use in your cooking. Thank you, Sharon. Stephanie, do you have to add to that? That was great, Sharon. What I want to add basically is that no one is ever trying to not allow you to eat the way that you're accustomed to and what your culture has taught you. Food is very personal um, and it, it carries a lot of memories and a lot of um, great feelings. But we wanna keep a few things in mind. Lots of times traditional cuisine um, may be high in sodium, may be high in saturated fat and may not have enough variety of vegetables. So, so a registered dietitian would be able to work with you to be able to look at your pattern of eating and give you suggestions for how you could still maintain your cultural diversity but possibly make some adjustments that would be still healthy by possibly incorporating additional vegetables into a dish that you already make or possibly changing the portion size. So rice, for example, that was mentioned is a staple in many, many diets, but possibly having less of the rice and incorporating more vegetables into a dish. So having an open mind. The other thing I like to do with the patients that I work with because I'm working family-based is getting people to try other cuisines and get excited about trying other things. So, um, you know, the area that we're in, in the state of New York, there's so much diversity and so much culture. And so considering trying maybe a different cuisine, a different way of making things by trying a new recipe, and we'll talk a lot about recipes later, that's a nice way to also be able to recognize different cultures, but still try and have the integrity of eating healthy because many of the components of a recipe put together are what create a healthy recipe together and a healthy dietary pattern. Excellent, thank you so much. And such, such important and, and valid points. Um, and just to bring up some images here, Stephanie, um, you wanted to show some of these plate planners of some ideas of real life proportions instead of the regular graphic we had before. Yeah, so I use these very often in counseling patients. I'm working with children and adolescents and their family members. So the plate on the left I would use for my older adolescents um, and the, the family-based learning. And the plate on the right is going to be for my younger audience, my eight, nine, 10, you know, or younger. And so the idea is the plates are both similar in the depiction, but the idea is trying to have enough vegetables, have representation from fruit, um, because it can add a very nice sweet flavor. I very often will recommend at the end of a meal to have some fruit to clean the palate and you feel like you're satisfied. Um, but it's emphasizing portion control. A big thing that we're finding um, 
you know, these days is that more people are eating out, more people are not preparing food at home. And we'll talk later about how that can fit into a healthy dietary pattern. But portion size wise, restaurants are giving you large portions. And so when we are cooking at home or preparing at home or planning our meals, we, we still do wanna keep in mind that there is portion control. And so the plate on the right might be a more appropriate portion size for a 10 year old, whereas the plate on the left might be a more appropriate portion size for my older adolescent 19 year old. Great, and such good uh, visual depictions of how a plate could realistically look. Um, and Amy, just, if I could also add, um, sure. just to, to add to what Stephanie said and just looking at these pictures, I think these are awesome because they show the protein, they show the fiber, they show, you know, the vegetables, but going back to traditional, you know, spices that we were speaking of, you could take this exact plate and make it taste different every single night. So you could put teriyaki sauce on it one day, you could put a peanut satay, you know, Thai dressing on it another night, you could put um, like a Mexican uh, sweet lime chili powder on it. So it's the, the foundation is still there, but again, your taste buds are excited when we get all of these different, um, you know, cultural um, additions. Yes, and, and dietitians get a bad rap for being the food police, but really we love food. We want to <laughs> encourage food. We want people to love food as much as we do. So excellent points. Thank you, ladies. Um, and so for some people where this might be a little bit of a transition to a plate like this, or a little bit of a harder move to a healthier lifestyle, um, Dr. Jamin, what are some tips and tricks that you have that you give to patients to transition to a healthier eating lifestyle? So my number one biggest tip to all my patients is to take a moment, take a step back and think about what their life is like. How busy are you? Do you have time to meal prep? If you do, how much time do you have? Can you put aside time on a weekend? Should it be a weekday? Um, do you wanna spend more time with your kids? Would you prefer to do some meal planning with your kids? So the first step I always say is to take a step back and see what you are able to do and what is realistic for you because what we tend to see are the you know, folks who decide to change everything and then can't keep up with it. And then there's almost like this rebound, you know, weight gain and, you know, depression and changes in mood um, and then overeating, you know, resulting from that because you're upset and it becomes this vicious cycle. So my biggest tip is to take a step back and see what is realistic for you. So um, following Sharon, to, to get personal, my time for meal prep is Sunday evenings with my kids. Um, so I need to make sure I get to that Sunday evening time frame because I've noticed if I can't, then I just don't feel very good if I'm not eating, you know, certain kinds of foods and, you know, throughout the week. Um, which brings me to my second tip, which is to know your limitations, right? So if I had a broken bone, I am not Googling how to fix my broken bone. I am going to the orthopedic surgeon to figure that out. So what I have done in the past and I suggest patients to do is talk to your provider and see an RD. Definitely, definitely see an RD. This is what you study. This is your whole life. And I would like to tell you what my life is like. And you tell me where you think the first and the second steps could be, what you think is reasonable, even if it's something as small as start eating a couple of more fruits, you know, to start with. I like to have my RDs there with me for that process so that I'm not giving myself additional work as like, I'm gonna go Google and I'm gonna research and I'm gonna find recipes. And, you know, I like the guidance. Um, so that's my second tip. Uh, my most favorite trick, once you do a small transition, even if it's something as small as, I'm going to incorporate uh, an apple every day, even if it's something as small as that, um, I love to tell people to see how they feel a couple of days later, because you can feel a difference based on what you put in your body. Um, and that alone is so helpful to keep that momentum going. Um, and that's, you know, a trick that I like to say is just pay attention. Don't just do it. Pay attention to everything. Do you sleep differently? Do you feel differently? Do you have more energy? Um, and I think that in itself is such a reward to keep going. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamin. And um, Stephanie, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, so Dr. Jamin, those are such fantastic tips that you really talked about. 
Um, and I agree with so many of those things, you know, small steps lead to big changes. And I often um, give the analogy of being in the driver's seat and the speed limit. You know, you can go 20 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour speed zone, or you can go 40. If you go slower than you're supposed to, you're still going to get there. And maybe that's the pace you need to go. Whereas if you go too fast, you might take two steps forward and four steps back. I like to focus on not what you're giving up, but what you're gaining. Um, and a lot of times people say, oh, I have to give this up and I have to give that up. This is going to be so hard. I can't have my favorite foods. I can't do this. What's my family going to think? And so what I like to focus on is improving your health and how much more energy you're going to have. You know, being intuitive about the eating that you're doing. You know, when you did have that, you know, item that you planned, how did you feel? Did you feel more empowered? Um, how did it work out? Not everything is going to work out. I love when my patients come back and tell me what they tried and what they liked and what they tried and what they didn't like. And then I try and strategize with them and find out, well, what was it about the way you tried it? And, you know, and we'll talk more later about picky eaters a little bit, um, but there are different ways to approach it, but you have to hear the patient. You have to hear the client, the person. You have to hear what they're saying. Our goal is to personalize and everyone has different likes and different needs and you know, it could be not just me, it could be me as the mom and what do I have to do for the rest of my family? So focusing on that and really focusing on nutrient density, trying to choose foods that are nutrient dense that provide a lot of good vitamins, minerals, macronutrients and not having so many processed things. And that's a trade-off because very often people value their time and the dietitian values your time as well. We understand the convenience, but lots of times with quick, easy meal prep, which we'll talk more about and a dietitian will strategize with you, you're able to get things on the table and still have time with your children. So I might suggest a one pan meal that you put everything in the oven. And now while everything is cooking, you have time to go over homework or you have time to find out how your child's day went or you have time to do something personal for yourself. So it's all the big picture of everything. Great. And I see you have some illustrations here of just some very simple some simple swaps to swap, you know, fruit flavored yogurt and a medium sized muffin with plain yogurt and some berries, some very easy, manageable steps. Um, you know, egg, sausage and cheese burrito with to switch to two tacos and, and have a little more nutrients, a little less processing, um, yeah. which are really excellent opportunities there. Sharon, do you have to add to this? Yeah, so I think, you know, we're standing here celebrating Registered Dietitians Day, and sometimes I, I like to correct people and say, like, you know, I'm the anti-diet dietitian. I think when we think diet, it sounds so, um, like, depriving ourselves, a lot of what Dr. Jamin and Stephanie spoke about, and I think we need to make it more of, like, inclusive. Well, what can I have? And thank you for pulling up my slide. So, you know, just to define this, I like to share this with a lot of my patients. When you look at the word diet, you have D-I-E, which is die. And when you look at healthy, you have H-E-A-L, which is heal. So a lot of what, how I, you know, coach my patients is through, um, you know, behavior and really identifying their goals. So if we're putting them on a diet, then the only thing we're doing is managing your intake, uh, your food intake and your exercise over a period of time to lose weight. So the end goal is just the number on the scale. It's managing. It sounds like another to do for the day. It sounds burdensome and it only focuses on the food and the exercise. But if we really look at it as a healthy lifestyle, and I'm always correcting people when they're like, all right, well, when you put me on this diet, I'm like, no, no, no. this is like the rest of your life. Um, we're really talking about incorporating positive choices into everyday routines to increase the quality of life by looking and feeling better. So we're putting the emphasis on incorporating. So that's a collaboration. That means you tell me what you like. I tell you how that feels. And we share that knowledge together, positive choices. So it's a little more optim more optimistic tone, um, everyday routine. So this is lifelong and increased quality of li life, okay? And feeling better. So I think it's so important that we start to really hone in on, on our feeling and not how we look or a number. Again, I work with people who are struggling with weight loss. So a lot of it has to do with numbers. And to go even deeper, I'm sure all of us in the healthcare um, realm use the SMART goals. So S-M-A-R-T, 
SMART standing for a sustainable, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So if we really have this goal of being healthy, what does that mean to you? How are you going to sustain it? And are the tactics that we're going to be taking together going to be realistic within a certain amount of time? So make sure they're smart. Great. Such good tips and tricks. Thank you, everyone. Can I add one more just quick little thing? Um, sure. You know, we've, we've spoken so far a lot about, you know, weight loss and losing weight and things like that. But healthy eating is for anyone. There are many people who struggle with their weight as well, and they're trying to gain weight um, for various reasons. So a, a healthy dietary pattern, a healthy dietary plan can fit anyone. And that's where a registered dietitian would come in because we would be able to look at your individual needs and we would be able to guide you. Sometimes people don't always know the right way to approach that. And so they're stuck and they don't make the change. So that's, we're here to motivate and we're here to guide. And coach is, you know, a word that Sharon used, we're here to be a coach as well. Yes, really good depiction of our profession for sure. And now specifically into meal planning, because people always want to know, what should I eat? How should I do this? Um, Stephanie, what suggestions do you have specifically for meal planning? So for meal planning, the key that I recommend is planning, right? A lot of times I have patients that'll say that they just don't know what to make. They have no idea what to eat. They're lost. They open the refrigerator and they stand there and they're like, I don't know what to have. So planning, you know, is very, very important. Dr. Jamin mentioned she does it on Sundays. I very often will do a lot of that on Saturdays. I love the idea of themes. So, you know, Taco Tuesday, Meatless Monday. Um, I love putting labels on things and names of things to make them more exciting, especially for kids. So if I say juicy broccoli, that sounds a lot better than steamed broccoli. Um, so getting the whole family involved if we're, if we're planning for the family, that's very important because I might know what I wanna make for dinner, but it might not be what my teenage daughter wants or what my husband wants or vice versa. Um, and so communicating is really, really important in terms of planning. And that might start with something as simple as going through the ad or using an app. Like there's an app called Flip, and we'll talk about apps a little bit later. And I love that app because I can pull up the ads for several different uh, supermarkets on one app and I can see who has what on sale. So maybe if chicken breast is on sale this week, maybe I'm gonna plan my meals around chicken breast. Um, and then what vegetables can I get fresh? Maybe if the frozen vegetables are on sale. So planning is really, really key um, to making sure that you have the right food um, available so that you can make it. And then I mentioned before that not everybody um, is able to cook. So if I'm going to eat out, I wanna go to an establishment that's going to have healthy food. I don't wanna you know, throw anyone under the bus and name any restaurants, but certain places don't have the healthiest food. So I wouldn't suggest that you go there. If you wanna to plan to eat healthy, you have to go somewhere where healthy food is available. Great, thank you. And Sharon, I pulled up your suggestions here and you, I'm sure you have a lot of suggestions for meal planning. Yeah, I mean, even before I look at this, um, you know, we speak so much about planning and I also have my Sunday and my Wednesday where I prep my meals. But I mean, if I had to be realistic on a day like today where I'm working from nine to five and then preparing for something to do after work and, you know, if you guys have kids, sometimes it doesn't always work. <laughs> we, we, we're not always prepared to plan. So I think it's so important to just stock up on essentials. So if there's any tip I ever give anyone, it's like, what are your emergency foods or go-to foods to just have, you know, in the pantry or in the refrigerator um, that are non-perishable? So maybe canned tuna, canned beans, maybe um, have some hard-boiled eggs available, or even, you know, if you're vegetarian, have some tofu or tempeh because there's no cooking involved with that. You could eat it, you know, straight out of the refrigerator. Having nut butters as your source of healthy fats, having you know, fresh fruits such as apples or baby carrots and hummus. And we'll go over, you know, individual foods, but most importantly is you need to be prepared. You know, we need to eat every single day. So there needs to be food stocked up in the house every single day. Otherwise we are left with, you know, grab and go foods, which are usually the potato chips or the cookies or eating whatever is left over on your child's plate. So I think preparation um, can mean so many different things. You don't necessarily need to cook, but have something available for, um, you know, the days where you're busier than others. And um, here, you know, I, I always suggest, you know, oatmeal is a good option for, for breakfast because it's got a lot of fiber in it. It has a good source of protein in it. 
Um, and it's very, very filling, but I always get the reaction, well, uh, yuck, I don't like the consistency of it and has no flavor. And I'm like, well, we got to jazz it up. I, as you mentioned, you know, dietitians really are foodies. We enjoy eating food. And I think a lot of where we come up with our meal plans are just like, experimenting in the kitchen it's it's it comes all the recipes that I've created for the meal plans that I provide have just been mistakes <laughs> they were me doing something that I didn't really plan to and I was like wow this tastes good so um oatmeal you know add some chopped up nuts for those of you who say it's a very soft texture I think the nuts give it a more thicker and crunchier consistency add cinnamon add unsweetened cocoa powder um, there's uh, flavored, um, you know, flavored creamers. We use, you know, the the coffee. I'm sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to use brand names here, but there's <laughs> flavored um, coffee creamers that you can use that come in Irish cream, French vanilla, hazelnut. Um, you know, I even found a Reese's Pieces coffee um, half and half, you know, in one of the supermarkets. And I'll just put a tablespoon of that to make my oatmeal taste different every single day, so it's not always the same thing. Um, there's these defatted peanut butter powders that are out there that are very low calorie and can add like a chocolate peanut butter taste. So if you're into like that chocolate peanut butter, like I am, this is a great way to, to flavor up your oatmeal. Um, mashed bananas, ground flax seeds, chia seeds, berries, you know, what oatmeal is going to take the flavor of whatever you put in it. Um, cottage cheese is another option. Again, I get that. I don't like the consistency. So once again, adding those nuts, um, maybe drizzling a little bit, little bit of honey or whatever flavored fruit you like. Um, and then Greek yogurt, is, it's very high in protein. It doesn't taste like most of the American um, watered down yogurts. It's, it's a lot more creamier. So, um, you know, I always say be open because a lot of times I get a little bit of resistance when I'm making these suggestions. So try the whole fat yogurt, um, you know, if you don't have an issue with your cholesterol. And of course, speak to your dietitian. There's so many different options out there, um, but you, you are the CEO of your body and you could flavor up the food any which way you like. Um, but again, that's what dietitians are for, to open up your horizons to um, making your food, you know, flavorful. <laughs> Thank you. And to that end, Sharon, um, do you have recipe swaps as well as healthy snacks and meal planning ideas you might wanna share with everybody? Yeah, so if you wanna pull up my slide, um, I know that during this whole, like right when quarantine started exactly a year ago, I found myself in the kitchen more um, baking. I, for me, it was a form of therapy, but um, I swapped a lot of ingredients that I found online um, with, you know, alternatives. So instead of using sugar, I might use dates or applesauce, banana, or a low calorie sweetener like stevia um, to replace fat. I know some people look at me like I'm crazy when I say this, but um, chickpea juice could be used as an alternative to um, an egg. So three tablespoons of chickpea juice um, could substitute for the egg in any recipe if you are even vegan or vegetarian and you don't use um, eggs in your um, baking. Avocado is a fat replacer. Um, applesauce can also, you know, add a little moisture to whatever you're baking. Pureed beans. I, I have a great recipe that I always give to my patients um, for a brownie mix. So instead of using, you know, white flour, you can use beans uh, or black beans or, or even chickpeas. Pumpkin is very similar to applesauce. It's less of a gooey texture. Um, shredded zucchini um, can pop up in any of your muffins or your baked goods. And uh, tofu cream cheese is, is also a good um, alternative in pastries. And then the next slide, so that's more for the baking, but if you're cooking, um, again, if you're just trying to cut down on your carbohydrates or you want something that's less caloric when it comes to noodles, you might wanna swap out for zucchini noodles or daikon noodles. So that way your vegetables take a different shape. Um, you can use spaghetti squash, and there's also a, a, a wide array, I'm sure most of you have seen these um, bean pastas that come from chickpeas or lentils or edamame, and they come in noodles, they come in um, macaronis, they come in elbow shape, so spiral uh, for, for all the kids. 
Um, instead of rice, as I mentioned before, you may want to try riced cauliflower. Now they even have this in the frozen section of most supermarkets. Instead of using bread or flour, there's a lot of alternatives um, for people who are gluten free and you may want to try almond flour, coconut flour, cassava flour, tapioca flour. All of these are readily available. You do not need to go to a specialty um, health store. A lot of um, supermarkets now have an aisle with all these alternative ingredients. Uh, crackers can be swapped for flaxseed crackers or even the bean crackers. And instead of using wraps that are made from um, wheat flour, you might even want to just take a bunch of chicken strips and vegetables and a little bit of a peanut sauce and wrap that in a collard green or kale. So vegetables don't need to be on the side. They can just be incorporated as part of the main feature. I'm getting very hungry from this conversation. Uh, Stephanie, do you have uh, recipe swaps or snacks to add to this? Yeah, so these are really, really great suggestions. I love them all. Um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is the way that you cook the food makes a big difference as well. And so keeping in mind that when we use lower fat ingredients, sometimes we have to add other things. So a big complaint that patients often have is that chicken and turkey is dry. And they tried to swap out and use chicken and turkey versus beef, and it's dry. And so that can happen sometimes, and that might mean we need to add moist ingredients in. So that might mean adding some peppers and some onions into your ground turkey so that it's moister. It might mean adding some fruit and you can cook with fruit and sometimes that's gonna add a component of moisture. Um, I see that you have the slide up here. This is a classic example here. The item on the left is a typical burrito bowl um, that looks like something a lot of people might order and get or make at home. And it has a large amount of calories. It's also very high in sodium and it's not nutrient dense. It doesn't have as many nutrients in it. Whereas the example on the right, instead of having the white rice, we've substituted and used, and used brown rice. Um, and then for part of the rice, we're using some romaine lettuce or another lettuce of your choice. You might choose baby spinach instead. Um, the beans that are being used are a bean that is lower sodium because canned beans, although they're convenient, are very high in sodium. And there's more vegetables added. The example on the left just has some jar salsa. The example on the right has actual vegetables in there, grilled vegetables or sauteed vegetables. Um, the jalapenos are a great way to add flavor to, you know, the flavor is going to pop. And lots of times that's what's necessary for us to take on a new food. And the amount of cheese that's on there is reduced. And we don't have to have the sour cream and the cheese. Lots of times people are able to do one or the other and not really notice the difference. And we're using fresh avocado slices versus using a guacamole. And guacamole can be healthy depending on how it's made, but it is a, an item that can have a lot of calories in a smaller amount. The other example, you can't see it all the way on the right possibly, the difference, but the one on the left is a sweetened iced tea and the one on the right is an unsweetened iced tea. So those would be easy ways to make simple changes. And if you ask me, the one on the right looks more appealing. Um, I often recommend that we use different vegetables that the colors alone are inviting enough for us to say, hey, what is that? Um, to get curious. When I'm trying to get patients to try my recipes, because we have a whole library of recipes on our Facebook page for Power Kids, I want the children in the program to just look at the recipes. I'm fine if in the first session, all they do is peruse the recipes and say, hey, I wanna try this and I wanna try that. Even if they don't try a new recipe, because the recipes that I have have all been adapted. I've changed the flour, like Sharon said, I'm using a whole grain flour or using a different whole grain ingredient, or maybe I'm using a fruit instead of a sweetener. So those are all ways to do some simple recipe swaps that can all be effective. And if you don't know how to do that on your own, working with a dietitian will be able to help you with that. Excellent. Thank you, ladies. So now we're going to have a little bit of fun, everyone, because we want to play a game with you to see how much you know, and we want to address some common nutrition myths and beliefs. So you are going to see Zoom polls pop up on your screen. If for any reason you are just listening to us or if you're not technologically comfortable, just listen. You can also try to guess the answer. They are all true or false. And our panelists will share with us whether or not they are true or false. Of course, you also can interactively play along. We love to see what your answers are. So the first question you'll see pop up on your screen is true or false. You do not need to detox 
quote unquote detox regularly. Sharon, is this true or false? So I don't know if we're waiting for everyone's answers. I'm, I'm curious <laughs> to hear what everyone <laughs> is thinking. Um, so, you know, our bodies are just this miraculous machine and we have all these organs that are specific to um, naturally detoxing our, our, you know, and from any, you know, poor diet um, that we're consuming. So I think that, you know, if you naturally just eat a diet that has whole foods, vegetables, fresh fruits, you're drinking enough water, um, you're exercising, you have healthy bowel movements where whatever you eat is coming out. I think that's a natural form of um, detoxification. So personally, um, I don't push so much of the juice cleanses because I think that they often leave us hungry and they're short term. And it's again, a diet. It's something you do. It's something you stop and it's not teaching us how to live, um, you know, our best for, for life. Thank you. And the majority of our audience agreed with you. <laughs> All right. Question number two is for you, Stephanie. I'm going to say true or false frozen fruits and vegetables are just as healthy as the fresh ones. All right. So again, I'm not sure if we're giving the group a chance to answer the question. Or a, not. a majority of people have answered already. So you can okay, go sure. ahead. All right. So basically sometimes frozen fruits and vegetables can actually be healthier than the fresh version, especially if you're buying them and they're sitting in that drawer in the bottom of your refrigerator wilting and they're losing some of their nutrients. Um, the goal is to make sure we're not having added sugars and added salt and added um, sauces and things like that. But frozen vegetables right from the farm are very often packaged. Um, and so they can be even more healthy than fresh versions. Um, easy to cook. They add a lot of convenience. Um, and in terms of fruit, same thing. There's something about frozen berries and yogurt that just give it a different flavor in a different way. And so they can be just, you know, they can be healthier sometimes, if not equally as healthy to have the frozen version. When it comes to canned, that's a little bit different, but the question was about frozen. <laughs> okay. Question number three, Sharon, is about something that's very popular these days, intermittent fasting. True or false, I can only eat between certain hours of the day and should practice intermittent fasting. Give our audience just a few seconds and people are, are answering now. Okay. Go ahead. What is the answer? So I think it's a more of like a maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, you know, we need to have time restricted eating, which is now also known as intermittent fasting. And there's a reason why we call breakfast breaking the fast. So I am not promoting, um, you know, there's different types of intermittent fastings that exist now, like people fast for five, two days out of the week and they eat for five days of the week or, um, you know, they, they'll fast for 16 hours of the day and then allow themselves to eat for only eight hours. I, um, I do not promote intermittent fasting. I, I think it's, again, something that's not sustainable, but I do believe that we need to give our bodies at least eight hours of just rest and recovery um, to, and, and that usually happens naturally with our circadian rhythm when we're sleeping. So um, I've worked with people who wake up in the middle of the night just to eat. So I think you need to really look at your day. Um, you know, if you find yourself eating more calories late at night, ask yourself, is it that you may have skipped meals? Maybe you didn't have a breakfast. Maybe you didn't eat enough. Um, so I, I think, again, as um, Dr. Jamin explained, you know, take a step back, <laughs> reassess, you know, what your day is like. And, um, you know, you don't need to fast, but uh, try to get, you know, your hours of eating within a certain window. Okay. Question number four is for Stephanie. True or false? I can support a healthy immune system through diet. I do not have to take vitamin or mineral supplements. True or false? We're of a lot of mixed reviews here. So basically a healthy, well-planned dietary pattern can support your immune system. All of the nutrients that we take in in a typical eating pattern that's healthy should be adequate. We know that there are some times when supplementation may be necessary. The first 
thing that we would recommend would be fortified foods. So we know that milk, for example, and dairy products are fortified with calcium and vitamin D. So that's a way of getting extra calcium and extra vitamin D. Um, some other products are fortified breakfast cereals and different things like that. So if you're not able to plan based on the meals that you're having with the whole foods, then sometimes adding in some fortified foods are necessary. Obviously, there are going to be outliers. If there are people with medical conditions and their absorption issues, then a supplement might be necessary. But we get more than enough vitamin C from the average American diet, zinc, you know, those are two key nutrients. Enough protein is very important for our immune system. And most of us are getting a lot more protein than we need. So it is possible to eat healthy enough. But if you're not able to do that, a dietitian can help you with that. Okay, the next question is very popular in terms of what's going on in everybody's lives right now. True or false, um, there are foods that can support my mental health and have been shown to help me relax. Sharon, what is your thought on this? Is this true or false? Definitely true. <laughs> um, I think that when, you know, we, we call these macronutrients and micronutrients for a reason. They're things our bodies need because they do support our brain development. They do affect our cognition. They do affect our mood. Um, you know, when you eat foods that are highly processed and, and have nothing in them, you're going to feel empty. And when you eat foods that are high in amino acids, Amino acids affect the neurotransmitters, and those are the, um, the building blocks for impacting you know, serotonin and dopamine, which are those happy hormones that keep us you know, glowing. And magnesium is also known to, to relax us. Uh, some people take this in a pill form, but you can find foods that are good sources of magnesium as well. Um, you know, green tea, dark colored vegetables and, and berries all have antioxidants, polyphenols, all which affect our immune system, which affect our mood and our feelings. So I think, you know, in an era where we're talking all about hand hygiene and mask wearing, I think we also need to start asking ourselves, what are we putting on the inside of our body to um, protect our mental health and our physical health? Okay, Stephanie, this one I can relate to having little children. True or false, my child has tried that food once before, so he, she doesn't like it. Is that true or false? I'm going to give everybody just a few seconds to answer. All right. So okay, what's the answer? <laughs> so your child might think that they don't like it. Um, on initial trial, but we know that it's very important for there to be repeat tries. Um, and sometimes it's as many as 20 tries before a food is recognized and it is accepted. We want parents to lead by example and be role models. So if every time you put a piece of broccoli in your mouth, it's like torture, your child is going to see that and think that that also is not something that they want to have. Um, so really trying pizzazzing food up um, trying to have different flavors, like I said before, juicy broccoli, you know, tangy tomatoes, giving foods a different identity, not just saying, you know, steamed broccoli on your plate is very important. So with this one, it really does take trial and error. Um, there's something called food chaining, where if your child does like one thing, you would then have a similar food and sort of do the chain link fence, chain and have them try something else that's similar. Um, really, I want children to be able to identify that food is healthy but lots of times they're too immature to really take it you know, that way and say, oh, this is good for me, so I better eat it. Um, we know that taste and flavor are important. So maybe it's the way that it's being presented. You know, Physical appearance is really important. So if you have to get a little bit um, creative and cut things in different shapes, that might help um, as well as different flavors. So changing the profile um, is important. And you know, one of the resources that I talk a lot about with my patients is chopchopfamily.org. They you know, focus on healthy eating. They focus on children being in the kitchen, trying different things. I was fortunate to teach a cooking class for many years in my daughter's school. Um, and just seeing the kids try different things, put it in their mouth, um, that was a way for them to see that, wow, this can be something good. Um, and so try and try and try is what I recommend for that. And some adults too, for some sure. Adults too. <laughs> some adults too. And so for the last question of our game, it's going to go to Sharon, true or false, 
carbs, fruits, and grains are bad for you and cause weight gain. Let's give everybody a second to see what they say about that. If that's true or false, I think our audience is learning as they go. They're getting the answers right as we, as we go along. We're teaching them something today. All right, Sharon, what's the answer? Yeah, so that answer is, uh, is false. <laughs> um, I think <laughs> that everything fits into a healthy, balanced diet. Um, I think that you know, you'll notice that white stripped carbs are gonna be different than whole grain carbs. So I try to have my patients look at fiber content of their foods and one thing when you're looking at a food label is to make sure that the fiber is greater than three grams. And that's how you know if it's you know, a green light food, um, at least in my practice. Um, I think that you know, when, when you don't get enough carbohydrates in your diet from high fiber foods, you're, you're kind of left hungry. And I think we've all kind of said like, I never really get full until I have that slice of bread. Um, just ensure that your bread is, is dark in color, that the darker it is, the more nutrient value it has and the more dense it will be to keep you full longer, um, making you less likely to overeat later in the day. All right, thank you ladies for playing our game and for everybody to play along with us. Um, we will be, as we've been providing along the way, we will be providing you with some more tips and credible resources for information. Some of these great ideas probably are getting your mouth watering for dinner time tonight. Um, and we'll provide you with a credible list of nutrition information. Some of the apps that Stephanie wanted to share with you, we'll be emailing it to all of you um, so that you have those resources. But just to clarify for everyone, Sharon, what is the difference between a registered dietitian and a nutritionist? What's the difference between, are they, are they the same? Are they different? Uh, yeah, so I'm going to speak for every dietitian here who's probably corrected people when we've been called nutritionists. Um, it took my former, my, my surgeon that I worked with many years for me to train him to call us registered dietitians. And um, so yeah, the difference, anyone can technically call themselves a nutritionist. You could read a book, you know, be enlightened by what you read and think you're the expert and do, you know, some research and, and there is no um, you know, credibility for a nutritionist, but registered dietitians um, do specifically go through, they do have a bachelor's um, in science. Uh, we do need to go through a rigorous training of 800 hours of literally volunteer work of working in a clinical setting, which is mostly a hospital, long-term care, community setting, food service, and then we need to sit in um, for a um, credentialing exam to be registered. So there is a specific um, educational pathway that we need to follow. And then of course, um, to maintain our credentials and our credibility as experts in, in this a, a world of science and with all this emerging new trends that come out, we do need to um, continuing uh, education courses as well. So every registered dietitian is a nutritionist, but not every nutritionist is a registered dietitian. Correct. And you might even yes. see, um, you know, on some of our, um, you know, uh, credentials, you'll see RDN, which is a registered dietitian nutritionist. You may see CDN, which is a certified dietitian nutritionist. As long as you have that, that D dietitian in there, um, you know that they've gone through this specific pathway. Yes. And if I could it's good just, for everybody to know. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Stephanie. If I could just add one other thing. The, the great thing about being a registered dietitian is that you have so many other people that you can bounce ideas off of, and we use evidence-based information. So any dietitian that might not have the answer for you, we have these practice groups. There's, I think, 100,000 dietitians in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Going Strong. So we are basing the information that we're going to give you on lots of years of training, continued continuing education training and the strength of all the people we work with. You know, for example, working with Dr. Jamin and the medical students at Hofstra, that gives me a new way of enhancing my abilities to be, you know, a good healthcare professional. So it's the team approach, the collaborative approach that we're all healthcare professionals together, where someone who's just a nutritionist calling themselves a nutritionist on the outside might just hang a shingle and be working independently and they don't have all that support. Yeah, and, and to that end, what populations do um, RDs work with, registered dietitians work with? 
in the Northwell Health System. Dr. Jamin, perhaps you want to start with that question. Sure. Um, so I think RDs should work with everyone. Um, but from my setting, I do predominantly inpatient setting where I have a lot of acute patients uh, with chronic long-term disease processes. So they are 10 out of 10 of my patients get an RD referral because I think that it, there's always room for improvement in anything that they do. And I love to have someone see them inpatient. So any kind of uh, chronic disease processes um, that are occurring, diabetics, hypertensives, um, people you know who have partaken in pr certain kinds of diets, like someone who just became vegetarian and thinks that you know I'm going to become anem anemic. Um, so you know I like to get them involved all the time on an inpatient setting. So that's from an inpatient setting, but I think in an entire life setting any and everyone should see an RD to help to modify uh, practices that they have already in their eating patterns, in my opinion. Thank you, Dr. Jamin. Sharon, do you have something to add to that? Thank you, Dr. Jamin, for even being on this panel. Um, like I, I really, it, it really gives me a lot of you know, pride to have the support of, of doctors like yourself. And um, like she said, I think, you know, everyone can use a dietitian, even if, you know, we see doctors just for like an annual checkup, um, you might want a nutrition checkup, you may just want to make sure that what you're eating is inclusive of, you know, varied um, nutrients, if there's anything that you're lacking. And uh, if you're an athlete and you're looking to enhance your sports performance, this might be, you know, this might get you on your A game. And I think it's really important to note that all dietitians have a specialty, okay? I don't know everything about hypertension and GI issues, but I will refer you to a colleague of mine who may specialize in that. So I think it's so important to understand that if you, you met with a dietitian and she didn't give you, you know, the personal information that you were looking for, uh, there's a huge network. Uh, you know, Stephanie spoke about the, the eatright.org is where you can find um, dietitians within your area. And um, yeah, they, I think it's, it's, it's gonna be a very specialized approach. So I think it's open to, to anyone and everyone. Stephanie, do you have to add to that? Anything to add to that? Um, basically just that there, you know, dietitians do specialize like Sharon said, and that we would work to try and find you a dietitian in any area. And so the service line, I represent the pediatric service line. We have dietitians in all different areas and all different specialties. And we do collaborate together. We speak to each other. Um, and so it, the direction that you would go for your referral would be based on what your needs are. And we would do our best to accommodate that. Yes, and across the Northwell Health System, we have dietitians that specialize in pretty much everything, um, whether it be for GI conditions or diabetes, cancer, uh, weight management, surgery. Um, and at the end of this program, there'll be a survey where you can put your information if you wanna be referred to a dietitian and we will direct you to the correct referral based on your needs. So be sure to put your needs in there for what you're seeing the referral for why you wanna see a registered dietitian. Dr. Jamin, you speak so highly about our profession, which is always wonderful to have the support of physicians. Um, why do you think in your practice, it's so important for patients? What is the vital role that nutrition plays? So I always tell my patients that you, you are what you eat. You only get one body in your lifetime. Um, so a little bit of extra thought going into what you put in your body can save you preventive medicine so much more in the future, right? So it can be, you know, food itself is a is a preventive medicine source, right? Um, so I I like to recommend it because I do think that having seen patients in the outpatient and the inpatient setting, I've been able to see patients get off of diabetic medications, hypertensive medications, just by making steady, small even changes to their diet. And I will say, you know, I support it so much because I myself see the benefits. You know, I think we should always let the experts do what they're trained to do. So I speak to our RDs all the time and I'm like, hey, I'm so busy and I need to know what, you know, even protein bars I should be looking to eat when I'm really busy. What is a good one for me to try? Um, and I feel the benefits of modifications in my diet, which is I'm why I'm such a big advocate for it. Um, and for patients who come in healthy, who don't think that they need to see an RD, guess what? Your body changes and ages and things happen. And it's important to get 
you know, tips for, you know, gracefully aging with diet included, right? So I'm just, I just think it's just to let food be thy medicine as, you know, famous quote, but um, I think it's most important in day-to-day life. It, it changes energy levels, you feel different, you sleep different, so why not? Thank you. And I'll also add that also RDs, even if it's not a specific thing you're going uh, to them for, we're just there to support. We're there to help um, and guide and give you new ideas and and um, really help make things possible to put them into action. Sometimes you just need to talk it out with a food and nutrition expert. And that's, that's what RDs are. Um, Stephanie, can you give a, an, an overview of what the process is for seeing a registered dietitian? I know depending on different insurance plans and people's personal preferences, things are different, but maybe you could just give an overview of what the process is like. Sure. So the referral system is uh, varies a little bit across Northwell Health, but basically if you have a referral from your physician um, or your medical provider, it does help um, with reimbursement if you're submitting through insurance. The silver lining, so to speak, of the pandemic is that virtual nutrition services have exploded. And so I'm able to see patients, for example, in Brooklyn that never would have came to New Hyde Park, but now that I'm doing telehealth, I'm able to see them. So having a referral from your medical provider is very helpful. Um, and knowing you know, what your goals are and you know, that you have in mind would be important as well. But you can call your insurance company and find out what your covered benefit is. Um, if right off the bat, that's not a covered benefit, there are times sometimes when you will be billed for nutrition and then you could submit. And then from there, there's a chance that you'll get reimbursed for there. But the more that we do this, the more that we see if bills will be submitted and reimbursed, the more we see insurance companies have to recognize the value and the need for nutrition professionals. And over the course of medicine, this has happened with other things where you sort of have to prove the need first um, and then insurance companies will say, okay, then I'll cover it. So don't be discouraged by that. Um, and if you're seeing a dietitian through Northwell Health, we will work with you if you don't have insurance and your insurance isn't covering. Not every practice site requires that you're being billed through a nutritionist. Sometimes it's just a copay with the physician. So don't let that be a deterrent. You know, um, find out from us and we'll let you know how to be able to see us. But keep in mind that the telehealth is really valuable and it's a way for us to connect. It saves time um, on both ends. Um, and sometimes it's helpful because I might say to someone, well, what kind of granola bar to use Dr. Jamin's example and say, well, let me go get that from the kitchen and they'll run and they'll get it. And they'll show me the label right there on the screen. And right there, I can make a recommendation or I can pull something up you know, that I have you know, from a picture and show them right away where that was never possible you know, in the past for us to do that. So um, we are available. Um, on the extreme um, condition that we couldn't find someone in Northwell, then there are services on the outside, like Sharon mentioned, the eatright.org, find a nutrition expert, um, and you go according to your zip code. And there are, I checked today, 100,000 RDs in the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. Um, and so you should be able to find someone. Yes, and I will pull up the slide here. You will all get the referral information for um, three different sites at Northwell for specific contacts here and giving you the contact information for our Center for Healthy Living at Northern Westchester Hospital, as well as the Cass Institute for Women's Health and Cohen's, Cohen Children's. Um, these are just three sites and um, welcome to uh, use this information for referral purposes. Again, you can also put your name and information in the survey at the end of the program. And you will also get an email after the program is over tomorrow with all of this contact information. And again, Northwell Health System is a huge system. We're gonna find you a specialist that meets your needs um, and certainly will help you on your nutrition journey. The telehealth programming allows for a continued preventative and um, medical nutrition therapy in COVID times. Every safety precaution is taken if you choose to come in person as well. Um, so it is an ideal time to make um, a journey on, and learn something about nutrition and do something positive for yourself. I'll leave this up. 
Um, and I'll say thank you to our panelists for presenting tonight. I think this is a lot of information. And thank you to our RDs for keeping everybody healthy and moving forward in a nutritious lifestyle. I won't use the D word, I'll say lifestyle. And thank you to Dr. Jamin, as well as your fellow medical professionals who support our profession and continue to refer to registered dietitians. Um, we obviously agree with you that we think it is a wonderful um, uh, specialty for you to um, enhance your, your health and wellness and work as a care team approach. And from everyone at Northwell, thank you very much for your time tonight. And please fill out the survey because your survey is very important to us. We not only have nutrition counseling services available to you, but we continue to provide programs like this with community education. Community education is just as important. So please put any suggestions you have to see future programs to continue to learn this way. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Bye.